Let's have a prayer before we start our class, please. Our holy and good Father, you are the only true and living God, heaven and earth. You are all that there is and there will be. For our Father, you we are grateful for all of the goodness that you have given to us. Thank you for your Son, the hope of life we have through him. Thank you for your word and its power, its truth, to help guide us through this world. We pray that you will be with us tonight as we study your word, that we will have clear minds and good hearts. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everything is coming down to now the final episode in the ministry of Christ where we're at here in uh, Luke 22. Sunday morning, we noticed in the first 13 verses, is that three elements came together to set the stage. The stage is now set. Jesus is just about done teaching. Matter of fact, for all practical purposes, he is done teaching. Uh, in the first two verses of chapter 22, earth is going to make its preparation to kill Jesus. Verses 3 through 6, hell is going to make its preparation to kill Jesus. And in verses 7 through 13, heaven itself is making the preparations for the crucifixion. And when we get to verse 14, now things change and Jesus will make this statement in, uh, in uh, verse 15. Verse 14 says, and when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. They didn't have a clue what was about to happen. Jesus knew full well and what I want you to understand when, in trying to set the, the scene here in this situation, when Jesus says with fervent desire, he has been seeing this afar off for the last three years. And they would observe their Passover uh, during the feast. And this was going to be <clears throat> the last Passover. Now people will still observe it. But as far as heaven is concerned, this is the final last Passover. And what we're going to see here in these next few verses is the divine transition from Passover to Lord's Supper. That's why Jesus is saying, I have fervently desired to get through all of the noise. And there's been so much noise in this last year of our Lord's ministry with the teaching and with the Pharisees in particular and the rulers of the temple and all of the opposition that he was going through and having to uh, <coughs> deal with that and setting them down basically where they, they couldn't respond to what he was saying. And he was now telling them Jerusalem was gonna go down. There is clearly, I, I, I sense this, I don't, I don't know if you do, but I think if you, if you read it enough time, you'll get this sense that in the beginning of his ministry, Jesus turns water to wine at the wedding feast in Cana. And that's just a matter of fact of his divine power. But you go, you fast forward three years and now Jesus is full of emotion and passion. Not that he is afraid of Calvary, but he knows that they are not gonna have him with him anymore in the flesh. And it's just, I, I the sense I have always gotten from this is as if a parent is saying goodbye to their child. And the child isn't going to college, the parent is. The parent is leaving town and gonna be gone and the child is left alone. <clears throat> and the parent knows all the things the child is gonna go through. Jesus knows that too in the Gospel of John in chapters 14 through 16, Jesus will be preparing them for the receiving of the Holy Spirit when he will say, now I'm gonna leave, but I'm not gonna leave you alone. I have to leave so that the comforter can come take my place. And this is what he will do. And Jesus describes in detail how the Holy Spirit will support them and help them in their teaching, etc. But they don't get that yet. And so Jesus says, I can't tell you how, <clears throat> how much I have desired this moment. I want this here because this is, and I, I hate to use this word because it is so overused, like the word awesome is overused. And the word super. But Jesus is super important for him. This is profoundly important to the Lord that he is alone with his apostles. 
and being alone with them, this is what he's going to do. In verse 16, for I say to you, I will no longer eat of it. This is the last one. I will no longer <laughs> eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And sometimes when we read this, this, this confuses people because when we're at the Lord's table and we're observing Lord's Supper and, and the men are uh, uh, getting some thoughts together for it, uh, we have the order of the bread and then the fruit of vine. But we come to Luke and it, it sounds like he starts with the cup because he does. Well, if you've ever, ever wondered about that, I'll tell you what's going on here. This is the last moment this is the last act of the Passover. When they finished eating, they drank wine. And this is what Jesus is doing. They don't understand it yet, but the Passover is just <coughs> about done. And so what he does in verse 17, he took the cup, gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. That's the final statement of the Passover. Jesus is the Passover lamb. So that being done, now what happens is that he took bread. In some uh, versions, after supper, he took bread. After the Passover, Verse 19, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Wait a minute. He hasn't been crucified yet. He's not partaking of it, but he's telling them, This is what you're going to have to do. This is what you will do. This is what will replace this Passover. That Jesus is the objective of the original Passover. He now being the Passover lamb that Paul would go in detail in the Corinthian letter about. Is that now that I'm here, I'm not going to drink it anymore with you. Until the kingdom. Now here's the bread. I want you to take it. This is my body. This is my body which is given for you. And what I want you to note here. Uh, I just, I think it's important to repeat this when, when uh, we get to this point. Uh, men often, often men uh, wonder, you know, what should I say and do at the Lord's table? And that's a legitimate concern that men always have. And when, they're, when they are waiting on the Lord's table, they want to make sure that they don't leave anything out. And so you, you and, uh, please, please love me and be patient with me on this. This is not a criticism. It's an observation of 50 plus years that men will do everything in their prayer except give thanks for the bread. <coughs> I, I, I don't mean to be critical about that, but the example we have from our Lord is that when he took the bread, he gave thanks for it. Thank you, Lord, for this bread and distribute. That's it. If you did nothing else but just Thank God for this bread. You said everything that needs to be said. Same way with the cup. All right, end of sermon. But you get the idea. That's what this is. Now, when he did this, when he said, this is my body, which is given for you, do you think they understood what he meant right then? I don't think so. No, they didn't get it. They got it later when they observed it. Oh, that's what he was talking about. And then verse 20, likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, after supper, after the Passover. You notice the cup in verse 17 is the cup of the Passover. The cup in verse 20 is the cup of the Lord's Supper. And in the very same way, that is, he gave thanks for it, gave it to the distributor to the men, and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, let, let's talk about this for a moment. Because uh, this is a very important uh, aspect and dimension to the blood of Christ. Is that what did blood have to do with covenant? Covenant. Sometimes we can use the word contract or covenant. Because the old covenant was a contract 
that God made with the people of Israel that Moses said, here's what God wants you to do. Will you do it? If you remember that story, that when they agreed to it, what did they do to seal that covenant? Billy? They would sometimes like cut their finger. Or... No, no, no. And this, this, <coughs> this, this one moment when the law is given and they agree to keep the law, they, yes, sir. They slay a bull. Sorry? They slay a bull and they pass it through the house. Or sometimes. Not exactly. <laughs> close. Not it? A lot, a lot of animal sacrifice. Yeah. But there was a particular a lamb, lamb, a lamb that they killed the lamb and took the blood. And what did Moses do with the blood? On the altar. Right. 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 Two syllables sounds like. <laughs> or smeared it on. No. Uh, think the word sprinkle. <clears throat> no, I'm glad I, glad I asked it. He took it and he sprinkled it on the people. He sprinkled it on the people. They signed the contract. You buy a house, how many papers do you have to sign nowadays? <laughs> a lot. But you don't get the house, you don't get the car, you don't get in until you sign the contract. And you sign it in pencil. No, you gotta sign it in ink. It was, it was signed, you see, what did Jesus say? This cup now is the blood of the new covenant. <clears throat> Jesus is telling them, they don't understand it at the moment, but after the fact, most certainly they will look back and say, Jesus said, I'm gonna get on the cross and spill my blood and seal the deal. Sign the contract. And when that's signed, now it goes into effect. That's why they didn't observe the Passover. Because Jesus was the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb came and he said, Here's my body, which is broken for you. Here's my blood, which is the blood of the new covenant, which is not just any blood, it's the signature. You know, can, you, can just anybody sign uh, your contract? You have to sign it if it's gonna go in your name. The title, if you buy something, the title has to be released by the person who owns that. We all understand that principle legally. And that's nothing new. Here our Lord is now saying, this is all brand new. And I am now going to seal the deal. He will purchase the church. He will buy it. <clears throat> he will buy it with his blood. Who else could buy it? <clears throat> no one else could. You know, that's, that's just an amazing thought to think about that. That someone comes along and says, I can buy anything I want. Oh, yeah? The man that had every dime, every shekel, every uh, drachma in the world in the first century couldn't buy the church. It was bought with the blood of Christ. And this is what our Lord is saying. That's why this is such a profoundly transitional moment and why he said, I have fervently desired to keep this feast with you because this is going to be the last Passover and it will be the institution of the first Supper. So he says in uh, verse 21, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goes as has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to question on themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing. There's always some question whether or not, uh, at what point in this time did Judas leave? Uh, that he didn't observe the Lord's Supper with him. Well, right here, uh, it seems as if uh, he's, we're, we're not sure about this. In Matthew, he'll say, Lord, is it me? To me, it is just one of the most interesting things that I can't even begin to think what's going on in the mind of Judas. When he said, is it me? When Jesus said, yeah, he's right here with us. And uh, in Mark, they all say, is it me? Is it me? Is it, could it be me? Um, this is, well, I'm not going to preach it. This is, 
if you guys want to preach a sermon, preach a sermon on, on, on could it be me? And all these men who would become uh, powerful figures in the early church all recognized that they were capable of betraying their Lord, especially after Peter would deny him three times. I, I think that was quite cognizant in their thinking. John? I always think, you go back and you, is it me, is it me? And it's Judas asking him, is it me? He's already made the deal. That's right. So in my mind, I've always, I've always considered, I give him Judas a little break, and that I think maybe at this point, he doesn't think that they can actually kill Christ. I tend to agree with you. And that he, I, I got all this money. Yeah. Because he was, as John tells us, Judas yeah. was the the crook who kept track of the money. Right. Yes, so, he kept the truth because he was a thief. Right. So okay. I, I just think that maybe in Judas's mind, he, he please let me because then we later later see that yeah. yeah when he does figure it out and it is him. Yeah. What I, he does. I, I think you're right. I mean, that that <clears throat> to me that's a very compelling study to think about that. But I I, I think there's something to what what you're saying here is that when he agreed to betrayed Christ. He just gave him the name. He is probably thinking, I don't know where we're getting off into, but he's probably thinking is that, well, I've seen him, you know, raise the dead. Yeah. Yeah. He's, they're not going to do anything with him and I can make a buck on the side. So I'll do this. But then when Jesus says, you know, we'll betray, could that be me? Would, would that be a betrayal? And I think that lap, uh, afterwards there, Matthew 26 and 27, when uh, Judas realized what has happened, that's why he went out and hung himself. Because then it dawned on him the consequence of what he actually did. He thought he was just going to make a buck and Jesus was going to slip out like he had always done. Uh, but for whatever it is, and however that that um, that dynamic was, was playing out there, is uh, Jesus saying, one of you is going to betray me. And this is still in the same setting. It's nothing has changed here. Amazingly, almost surprisingly, and maybe even <laughs> frustratingly, and maybe even a little aggravation thrown in there. Verse 24, they start arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. So they go from, can I be the betrayer? Or maybe I'm the greatest. How can people, <laughs> you know, swing so far? on the spectrum of self-importance or self-inspection. That's what they're doing here. And the, the, the feeling I get here, now I'll, I'll show you here as, as, as we'll have time to end this tonight, uh, is that Jesus is done. He's done with the teaching. And there's going to be one more episode here. We'll, we'll see it. Uh, he says to them, verse 25, the kings of the Gentiles. Now he's going to rebuke them. And in a unique way, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Oh, you are such a wonderful person that you are lording your power and authority over me because you give me a crust of bread or a piece of land or this or that or whatever it is like most very astute and unscrupulous politicians, kings, princes, prime ministers, whatever. Just give them enough to keep them happy and we'll keep control. They keep control. And the people willingly give up their freedoms for it, for bread. And there are a lot of examples of that even in this, in this age, in our world of lots of nations that would willingly do that, give up their freedom for just give me what I need or what I want or what I rightfully have. We're seeing a lot of that. We're not going to go any further than that than just what you see that. He said, verse 26, but not so among you on the contrary. He who is greatest among you, let him <clears throat> be as the younger and let he who governs as he who serves. Now the Gentiles, that's the dynamic. The big guys on top, and he'll give you a crust of bread, but he is going to be Lord of you. And actually what he's doing, he's taking advantage of you and he's exploiting you. He said, but for us, we're not that way. He who is greater, verse, verse 27, 
And he who sits at the table or he who serves, which one is the greater? Who sits at the table or who serves? Is not he who sits at the table? Yeah, there's a rhetorical question. Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Now, common sense in their culture as well as in ours. Who is the greater? The one who is served or the one who does the serving? Well, the one who's sitting at the table says, you know, we'll have some more of this and we'll have some more of that because they snap their finger because of the position of authority. And the one who serves willingly and has to uh, legitimately submit to that. And he says, what am I doing? I'm serving you, showing them through his very life, through his service, he had already washed their feet. He had already shown them that he would speak with the woman at the well who was a Samaritan that the Jewish men were not allowed to do according to Jewish law, because it was coming down to their level. We're above that. <coughs> Jesus has showed them his humility throughout. And he said, this is who we are. We're not the served. We're the servers. And so he's trying to shame them with this. He said, but you are those who continued with me in verse 28 in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There's a lot there that, that we need to, to mention. Jesus is saying, you will be served because you will sit at my table. The kingdom that the Father is giving me, I'm going to give to you and you will sit at these tables. And then he says, and you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the tribes of Israel were, were gone. The only thing that was... Uh, left at that particular time was the tribe of Judah. Uh, and uh, you think, well, what does that mean? Twelve tribes of uh, Israel was a uh, metaphor for the kingdom of heaven, God's people. Now, my question is this. You answer it for me. How is it that these apostles will judge the people of God's kingdom? How will the apostles judge you and me and all the people who are in the kingdom? James? I mean, by their actions, by their lives, the, there's a standard that we're held. Keep coming, keep, go, keep going. You're right at the door, ready to open the door. Walk through it. <coughs> open the door and walk right through. You're almost there. That's as far as my brain went. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what else did they do? Teachings. Yes. With the spoken word and what we're holding in our hands. They will judge the 12 tribes of Israel by what they say, what they teach, what they write, what they have left for us. That was the whole point that Jesus is preparing these men to teach the gospel to the whole world, which is what they will do in their lifetime before it's over. So he's telling them, you guys stop fussing among yourselves about who's the greater. That's what the Gentiles fuss about. Remember the example that I've given that I've served you. You're the server, but you will one day sit at my table and you're going to be serving all of the nations of Israel, or all the people of God, the tribes, through your teaching, through their leadership, their example, as James said, and, and then through their teaching. You know, any, any question or comment, I've Kind of uh, rushed a little bit through that to get to where we want to get here tonight. Yes, Jared? Yeah, just, just an observation just about the connection here between these two little sections. I think, it, I think it just makes perfect sense that they start disputing about who's the greatest here because, you know, as they are defending themselves and saying, oh, is it me, is it me, you can see how naturally it would be like, oh, well, it's not me because I am such and such. And then others would be like, well, no, but I'm, I'm greater than you are, so it can't be me either. So you can see how it would devolve into what was supposed to be a, a humbling thing by Jesus saying, yeah, one of you is going to betray me. I was supposed to wake them up. Now it's turned to arrogance and yeah. pride. So. Right. right. I, I, I so wish that were not a human trait, but it is so common. And I personally have dealt with that in both Russia and in East Africa and Ethiopia. <coughs> all the preachers 
want to be the boss and trying to get it through their heads that no one is greater than the other. And I am not your boss, even though I'm bringing support because they will defer to you. Don't defer to me and don't defer to each other. We defer to Christ. It's just a natural thing that with many in many cultures, it's just, uh, and that's what you have to watch out for because they will use it to the point where they can corrupt themselves and have. And we've had to cut some in off just the other day. They don't get it. They want to be the boss. They want to be the man in charge to tell everyone else what they must do. That that does not fit into the model of the kingdom of heaven. And uh, it's just a reality that I, I wish were not true. Fortunately, with the exception of Judas, these men learned their lesson. And what I think is interesting is that post-Pentecost, when Peter was the one who stood up and preached the sermon, is there any indication anywhere in the New Testament after Acts 2 that any of the apostles ever felt jealous of Peter? None that I've ever, ever seen. Uh, Peter even himself said, uh, you know, Paul is just so above us. Some of the things that he writes, I can't even understand everything that Paul is saying. He deferred to Paul in his wisdom of the old law, etc. But there, there's no sense of that. I, I think there was, in the resurrection, there was a profound shift in the universe, in their thinking, where these men now became the servants. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is getting them prepared. But right now, they're not. And I get the sense here now that uh, he's losing some patience with them because of what will happen next. Verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Now, is this in connection with, in the context of who is the greater? If it is, it's interesting what he says, which certainly seems that way. Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. What would that mean uh, about, what commentary would that be about Peter's character? when the devil wanted to sift him as wheat. What do you think that would suggest when we sift flour? <coughs> Any thought or idea? Yeah, Mike? Break it up. Break it up? Keep going. It's a separation of value, value from trash. Keep going, keep going, keep going. A wheat from chaff. Keep going. That's right. Wheat from separate the wheat from chaff. Now we we've got the we've got the chaff. But now we got the wheat. So what are we going to do with this wheat now? We're going to grind it and grind it and grind it. And then the ladies sift it before they bake, unless we go to get a Sara Lee pie out of the freezer. Uh, what does the sifting do? Why why did why did they sift? Or even do they sift? Uh, Laser cooks it. What's the difference between sifting and not sifting? Yes. Makes it light. Yes, make it light and fine. And after you have sifted the flour, if you put a bunch of that flour in your hand, what could you do with that? You just blow away. You could just blow it away. That's what Jesus is saying about Peter. Peter, there's no substance to you right now. You are so easy. The devil sees you and he is licking his chops. Because you are going to be an easy mark for him. Which of course later he would be. When he denied him three times. But he wants to sift you like wheat. He said man I can turn Peter into nothing. And blow him to the wind. And use him anyway. There's no substance to him. That's what he's saying. And Peter, Peter. Now that might suggest. That Peter was in that conversation. But well you know. I can't imagine him not being in a conversation like that. Because of his personality and uh, his behavior, etc. But Jesus puts him straight on that. And remarkably, in verse 32, but I have prayed for you. Now that's interesting. The Son of God has prayed for Peter, the man who will deny him, that your faith should not fail. You see, now we understand the idea of the sifting, that his faith can just be blown to the wind and just blows away. There's nothing there. 
He's praying that Peter will be solid. He'll be strong. He'll stand firm. That it will not fail. And when you have returned to me, whoa, what's that suggesting? When you have returned, not when, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. There's, there's little doubt that our Lord in this statement, whether Peter recognizes it or not, he knows what Peter's going to do. He knows he's going to deny him three times. But he also knows, to Peter's credit, that he's going to have enough faith that the devil is not going to blow him to the wind. He's going to stay strong, and he's going to hold fast. And he's going to be sorry for what he did. Now, I, I know y'all don't have the steel trap memory that I do at 72. <laughs> you, you remember when I first came here, the beginning of the year, a sermon I brought early on. <clears throat> it was a character study, a comparison of Peter and Judas, and talked about the fact that on paper, Peter and Judas could be twin brothers. They did everything almost identical in their behavior, in their thoughts, in their faith, and how they live, uh, in their personal life, etc. And the only difference between the two, after one had denied and the other had betrayed, when you total up Peter and Judas, where they're almost identical, the one distinctive difference between the two was that when Judas sinned, he went to the priest for forgiveness. And they wouldn't give it to him, and he went out and hung himself. When Peter sinned, he went to the Lord and asked for forgiveness. That was the difference. And I think Jesus is saying that right here. Here. The old King James actually uses the word converted there rather than return, which is kind of, you know, we think of converted as our first coming to Christ, but he's saying coming back to me again right. is, is equal to that. That's right. And, uh, that, you know, now you'll be fully converted. Yeah, conversion change. Yeah, you're going to be changed from there. Yes, James? It's like, uh, I think it's like David. You know, David and Peter both full of mistakes, full of failure. But they, it doesn't seem like they ever fail to continue to keep trying. And right. You, depending on how you look at the end of David's life. But, you know, they kept trying. They kept turning around. They kept going back. Peter's faith here doesn't fail. His, his faith may be dented and may be cracked, but it's not completely <clears throat> We cannot overstate that point right there. That for all of us, even to this day, it's not what we've done. It's not our mistakes. It's what will we do about it. Will we pick ourselves up and we will turn to the Lord. That's the difference between a child of God and a child of the world. That was the difference between Judas and Peter. Ariel? Say, say that last part again, please. They, even though he knew about their betrayal, he still invited Judas and Peter yes. to his table. Yes, yes, yes. Still living, leaving it up to them. Though he knew what they would do, they need to make that decision. Just like a parent with a small child. I know what you need to do, and I have an idea what you will do, but I can't make you do that. You're going to have to do that of your own volition and of your own decision. And we'll see how much you have developed how much you've grown how much you've matured and that's that's right peter will mature into obviously be an icon judas will uh destroy himself john well it's very hard very hard to understand how god knows what's going to happen and we still have free will but the the statement reminds me a lot of when god said a king will do all of these bad things to you. And when you do choose a king, right. he knew they were going to do it. Right, right. But, but they, had, they had the chance all along. They had the chance all along of changing or learning from this. And so Peter's got the opportunity to learn from this. Oh, here's the father. 
to a 16 year old son, all right, son, here's the keys to the car. Now, I want you to be careful, buzzing. I know when you get out on the road, you're gonna hit that thing to 80 miles an hour. I know you're gonna, you know, now, be safe, etc. But I know what you're gonna do. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So uh, thank the Lord for His mercy, His foresight, and His patience, and His love to forgive us. Yes, John. And I think you, the free will is demonstrated here. Yes. Because <laughs> one did repent, and one didn't repent. Right. I mean, what better examples could we have? If Judas had repented, Christ still would have died. Right. Right? It, it would have, it's inevitable. It was inevitable. It was going to happen. Yeah. Someone was going to betray him. And if it wasn't Judas, did it just, just like, yeah, it, was, right. just like it wasn't right. Isaac's time. Right? It's just, okay, we'll get an we'll get scapegoat. We'll, Christ was going to die. Judas had the opportunity to save himself. Judas could have saved himself. He did Whatever our Lord was going to do was by the determinate counsel of God, as Peter would say on Pentecost. But Judas could have saved himself. It just was looking to the wrong source for forgiveness. And there's there's the sermon. People look to the world. I want to be accepted by the world. Judas wanted to be accepted by the ruling class. He didn't really care what the Lord thought about him. Though he was sad when it came right down to it. That was his loyalty. All right. Um, and then he says uh, in verse 33, Peter's response, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Do you think Peter believed that when he said it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely he did. My, my, how things can change overnight so quickly. There's a humbling lesson for every one of us here before we get too proud about how we proclaim our faith while it is comfortable and while it is peaceful and while I am in the pew. Sermon enough. Okay. So our Lord's response is, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you deny three times that you know me. Before daylight comes when this rooster is crowing, as do, do around our house at 4.30 or 5 in the morning. Uh, that, he said, you're going to deny me three times. Now, if he said, you're going to deny me once, that might be, well, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's probably thinking, no, not, no, no. Uh, whatever he is thinking about this, I have to believe that there's a part of him that thinks, <clears throat> really? You mean, is this possible? Because Jesus just said, one of you is going to betray me and you're at this table. And they're all saying, is it me? Is it I? Jesus now says, Peter, this is what you're going to do. Peter might be thinking, I don't know. He might be, maybe I'm the one that's going to betray him. And maybe when he went out and wept bitterly, as Matthew records, uh, he, um, I betrayed him. I have betrayed him. But Jesus was already in the hands of those who would kill him. One or two? One. Oh, good, okay. Because I, I, I want to get down to this here, to verse 38. And so he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, sack and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. So now they're still in the same context and he's, he's getting ready to leave. And this is gonna be his final teaching from verse 35 to 38, this is it. Now, he's, he's going to have to take care of some other things here, take care of business for the crucifixion. But this is his final teaching. He says, when I sent you without money bag, sack, and sandal, did you lack anything? They said, no. Earlier when he had sent them out, he said, they'll take care of you. He said, were you taking care of They go, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. All right. Then he said, but now, he who has a money bag, you better take it. Likewise, a sack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. That throws people thinking, okay, Jesus is talking about some kind of military action. What he is saying is you put all these things together. He said, I was with you before and I could protect you and watch you and take care of you and provide for you. He said, I'm leaving. You're going to be on your own. 
you better learn how to take care of yourself. And as it has been argued, the sword here is not the sword of like uh, King Arthur and Sir Lancelot. It was a small little dagger that oftentimes they would carry in the sash simply as a matter of defense. And I tend to think this is what he is saying. But he's not putting emphasis on it because Peter will talk about this sword. He said, for I say to you that that which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. He's saying, we're done here, but I have to go through this and it's going to be tumultuous. It's going to be violent. It's going to be dangerous. And when I leave here, you are going to leave, lead very dangerous lives. You're going to have to watch out for yourself. As he would earlier send them out, be as wise as serpents, harmless as doves. All right, if you're just harmless as a dove and that's it, you're an easy mark for the world and you're not going to be able to do the job that needs to be done. And so Peter's going to make this statement, and I know we're rushing it because we only have two minutes left here. But verse 28, he said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, here's what I understand this to mean. You may disagree, and that, that's perfectly fine. But the two swords are not swords. They're like butcher knives. And that at the Passover, it was customary to have these two knives. One knife was for slitting the throat of the lamb to bleed it. The other knife was to skin it so that they could cut it, prepare it, and cook it. And so it would be on the wall, and that would be quite common in there. Uh, when I was in Ethiopia, they were preparing for their Passover, and at the hotel, I said, I gotta go see this. And they took me, I said, yeah, come here, I'll show you. And they took the, the goat up, and they took his head around, and had his horn, and they stuck it in the ground, and slit his throat. They go, whoa, you know, we're, not, we're not used to all that just immediate violence. That, that was just part of it. And they're saying, well, here's two swords right here. And should we, should we be taking these? Now, later in this same chapter, Jesus is going to refute them and say, no, those who live by the sword are going to die by the sword. You're going to take this sword, and my kingdom is not of the sword. You remember when Peter's going to cut the ear off of Malchus? And so when he says it is enough, some have have uh, erroneously concluded that, yeah, two's good. One's not enough, three's too many, two is just the right amount. Now, that, that's, that's not what you say. Jesus, his last statement to his apostles is, all right, enough already. I've talked enough. You don't need it. <clears throat> Jesus is done. When he says it is enough, he said, you don't get it right now. I'm done talking. And that's an interesting note to end his teaching. Now he's still going to take him to the garden and tell him to watch, pray, but he's going to be delivered into the hands of uh, his enemies really quick. So his last personal intimate statement to his apostles is <sighs> it's enough. You know, I, I, I've talked long enough. You still don't get it. It's as if you can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk a plan, but people won't get it until they get out there and do it. A coach can sit there in the locker room and talk to his players all day long about how they're going to play this and play that, but it's like, you know, all right, you got to get out there and do it. And I think that's what we have here, and I hate that buzzer because <laughs> we want to talk some more about it. Maybe Sunday we'll talk a little bit more about it, but if you have questions, hold on to them. We'll, we'll cover it Sunday. Thank you. <coughs>
I don't know this. Uh, one of our deacons. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, next week we actually go to Pittsburgh to watch. Are you really? Hey, everybody, let's uh, continue with services. <laughs> I have just a couple announcements to make. Uh, Londa, Chris, and, and Lou's cousin Debbie is traveling to Rome tomorrow. And she's asking prayers for a trip. It's safe trip there, safe trip home. Uh, and in an evening of gratitude, uh, Thanksgiving devotional and pie night. Devotional and pie. Can't get any better than that. Sunday, November 19th, that's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, at 5 p.m. here at the building. Uh, bring your favorite pie to share, and drinks will be provided, and the devotional will be provided. So come, get a little feeling of God and a little feeling of, of pie. I'm excited about this. Um, you should have all gotten a flyer in the email. If you didn't, then your email's not on the list. We need to fix that. That is all the announcements we have. Good point. Uh, we go back an hour. Sunday morning at 3 a.m. So you probably want to set it before you go to bed. Um, but if you're one of those people who usually don't come to class, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll see you here at 9.30. Um, that's all I have, and we'll, Bob is going to give us some inspiration now. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I don't know about inspiration. You know, you wake up your age sometimes, which is 60, and then some days you wake up like you're feeling alive at 59 again. I just don't get it. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Kenny kind of talked about Sunday. He talked about knowing God and knowing the Bible. And for some of us, we didn't know God prior to the Bible as far as knowing how to get there. 
Some of you grew up on it. And that still doesn't guarantee that you're going to continue to follow God because we all know we have people who have fallen away even though they grew up in it. But I want to know how we got there to the point where we trust in this Bible and, and the word that's in it. So I'm going to, I don't know about your story, so I'll tell you a little bit about mine and how I got here and why I'm still here today. So growing up in my household, religion was not a factor at all in my household. There was no mention of God. There was no mention of anything church. Now, I always thought there was a God, but I didn't know God. I didn't know his word. I didn't know him. So my idea of Sunday afternoons was sitting on the couch and watching my Chargers lose almost every Sunday. <laughs> that was my idea, but it was still fun to me. I'm with my dad. I'm with my brother. And to me, that's what I thought Sundays were about. Then at the tender age of 19, I started dating Christina. And she and her family had some background of Church of Christ. Now, it was never forced upon me. As a matter of fact, Christina didn't even start going back. She had fallen away and didn't go back until she got pregnant with Jordan. But this is where I first started to realize or figure out about God and who he was. But even then, I didn't never open the Bible. So she starts coming back to church again. I'm staying home watching my losing chargers. And then one day she comes home and she is soaking wet. And I had no clue what kind of church she's going to. Well, come to find out, she decided she wanted to be rebaptized. And she got rebaptized. And then that Sunday evening, she asked me to come to church because she wanted them to introduce me and she had been talking about me. Well, that day I walked in this door, that door is a day I never left. And that isn't just because of the Bible, because I didn't know it still. Yes, I was studying with Barry Kirchhoff at the time, and he helped me out tremendously. But a lot of this had to do with you here in the pews. I learned from you how to love God, how to love one another, how to be a part of something which I never was a part of before. And it was a very different culture for me to learn how to do that. And you guys, by your examples, by watching you, listening to you, you guys talking to me, being friendly, helped me to never, ever leave God from that point on. And six months later, I was baptized. And it was just a wonderful blessing that my wife wanted to come back. It was a wonderful blessing that I got to be with this family. And I've known a lot of you for 30 plus years. And from that point on is where I really got to know God, start reading my Bible, start studying, and got to know the love and the faith and dedication that he has for us. So there's one scripture I'd like to read. It's 1 John 4, and where am I at here? 17 through 19. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God is them. This is how love is made complete among us, so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. Then the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he loved us first. And that is so true. So somehow, some way, not somehow I know, God's footprint was in my life. And he's been in your lives too. However you got here, you're here today because of the same love and passion that our Lord and Savior has for us. So if there's anything that we can do for anybody here tonight, we'd be more than willing to come to come up front, listen to your story. And if you need to be baptized, we'd love to do that too. Please stand as we sing. <coughs> I'm not a warrior. I'm too afraid to lose. I feel the call of fire, what you're calling me to do. Well, Lord, with your strength, I've got no excuse. Because broken people are exactly loose. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. You took a shepherd boy 
and made him a king. So I'm gonna trust you and give you everything. I'll be a conqueror, cause you fight for me. I'll be a champion, claiming your victory. So give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me your hope like Moses in the wilderness. Give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense. So I can face my giants with confidence. I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see you fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, Jesus, I'm gonna sing and shout and shake the walls. Won't stop until I see you fall. Gonna stand up, step out when you call. Jesus, give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me your hope like Moses. In the wilderness, give me a heart like David, Lord be my defense, so I can face my giants with confidence. I'll face my giants with confidence. That's pretty good. This evening, before you were at the almost close of this evening, so grateful and mindful for you are our God, the only one and true, true living God for all mankind forever, for all over this earth and the cosmos and everything that you've made. We collectively pray for Debbie and her travels. Overseas, so mindful for all the brothers and sisters of Christ here in this location. We pray for uh, individually and collectively that we can be all that we can, all that we can be, doing your work and your will, and having great faith, having the grace and the mercy. The confidence that we would uh, rely on your power and your plan. That we dive in your word each and every day. That we would be successful again as a group and an individual. For this, as we leave here, we are Christians throughout the world and we pray your kingdom will come and the will will always be done. Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.